In this video, we're going to talk about arrhythmias, and specifically, we're going to talk about the cause of arrhythmia known as a reentry. Again, kind of more specifically, we're going to talk about AVNRT or atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. And what this is, is it's a very specific type of reentry pathway. So we're not really going to talk about the global pathway that can cause reentry, that's uh, pathways uh, that can cause reentry in diseases like Wolf Parkinson White. We're going to talk about uh, the AVNRT or a nodal reentry, which is occurring within the AV node itself. It's one of the most common causes of supraventricular tachycardia and tachydysrhythmias amongst patients. So to give you a bit of a review before we start, we're going to look at the normal condu conduction system of the heart. As we know, our conduction is going to start at our SA nodes. This is our SA node here. It's going to travel uh, down to the AV node. So what we're looking at here is our AV node, and this is what we're going to be talking about specifically when we look at AV NRT. From the AV node, it's going to travel to the His bundle, and then from the His bundle down the bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers. So we have SA node to the AV node, AV node to the bundle of his, bundle of his down to our bundle branches, which are going to extend into our Purkinje fibers and allow for ventricular activation. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a look specifically at the AV node. So we want to um, look at what's happening in the AV node when we have an AV NRT. And when we have an AVNRT, what is specifically happening is that we have more than one pathway that an impulse can travel down. So if we're looking at the normal AV node, we generally see fast pathways. And I know the AV node slows an impulse down and has to jaw. But in terms of conduction, conduction is normally traveling through fast pathways within our uh, heart's conduction system. So our typical AV node looks something like this. We have a fast pathway that travels down the AV node and it's going to stimulate the ventricles. So this is our fast pathway, or this is our normal pathway. So we have a fast pathway. And the fast pathway has a fairly long refractory period, which is typical of the uh, AV node because we know the AV node's helping slow an impulse or gives us uh, a pause between the atria contracting and then our ventricles contracting to allow for some filling. So the fast pathway and we have a fairly long refractory period and I'll draw the refractory period in here by these dashed lines. Um, so the fast, it's, this is the fast pathway. An important thing to remember with the fast pathway is it has a long refractory period. Now, what happens when someone ends up with an AVNRT or reentry from a nodal tachycardia or a nodal reentry tachycardia is they have the development of an accessory pathway. So instead of having this fast pathway that's allowing for uh, the impulse, they have the formation of another pathway. And they, this pathway, they may not know they have it, they may not know they have had tachycardia until they experience their first event. And the reason for that is that the fast, the, slow, the accessory pathway that forms is generally a slow pathway. So we see the slower pathway, or it takes longer for this impulse to make its way down the AV node. And what that means is when we have a fast pathway with a long refractory period, by the time this slow pathway makes its way to the, the path that we're going to take to stimulate the ventricles, that tissue is in refractory. Um, so I'll kind of we'll indicate that by this kind of gray shaded area, is that tissue is refractory. So even though that green impulse or the, the impulse that's coming down the slow pathway is trying to make its way to the ventricles, it can't stimulate that tissue because it's in the refractory period. Um, where the refractory period, if we don't know what that is, it's the time in which it's really hard or impossible to stimulate another impulse uh, in, the, in the conduction system or in the uh, tissues. So this is our slow pathway. And what's interesting about the slow pathway or better slow pathways is that they actually have quite fast refractory periods. They have short refractory periods. So I'm going to indicate that it has this short refractory <coughs> period by these arrows here. So we have the slow pathway. And what's interesting about the slow pathway is it has a short refractory period. Or it is ready to be stimulated again at a much uh, faster rate. Now this doesn't matter for the majority of the population because we don't have another impulse generated until both the fast and slow pathways are out of refractory period. So it's taking the SA node um, long enough that by the time another impulse comes all of this tissue is at a refractory and the same thing happens again. We have an impulse that's going to travel down our 
It's going to travel down our fast pathway, causes the refractory of the tissue leading to the ventricles. By the time the slow pathway makes it there, that tissue is refractory and we don't have to worry about it being stimulated. Now, when this doesn't occur like this is when we start to have reentry. And we can have kind of two different causes of reentry. One is due to a premature beat. So we have the presence of this accessory pathway um, as well as a premature beat. So we're going to call that cause one or uh, so cause one is due to a premature beat. Or we can have a second cause, which we'll call, call cause two. Cause two can be the result of uh, a blockage in the conduction pathway or a unidirectional block. And we'll explain how both of these things work. So in order to have an AV NRT, we need to have specific conditions met, or we need to have really specific conditions that are met. And I can kind of outline these here. So for the premature beat um, cause, the first thing we need is we have to have an accessory pathway. If we don't have a slow and fast pathway present, then this can't happen. We need to have two pathways. So we have to have the presence of an accessory pathway. Now that alone is not enough. We can't just have an accessory pathway. We need some other things to happen in order to have an AVNRT occur. So the second thing is we have to have a premature beat. Or a premature beat can lead to things going into disarray. And finally, that's still not enough. I can't just have an accessory pathway and a premature beat. I also have to have critical timing. Or because we're dealing with refractory periods, this tissue only has a short window in which it can be stimulated. And if we don't meet that window, then we can't have an impulse. So again, if we're looking at this premature beat cause, we'll draw in our fast and slow pathways. So we know that we have our slow or our fast pathway that's going to travel quickly down the normal conduction pathway, and it's going to cause a refractory period. So it travels down here. We have this refractory period. We have the slow impulse that's taking its time, and it's slowly coming down this accessory pathway. And it's disappointed to find out by the time it gets to the tissue that's leading to the ventricles, the fast pathway has already been there, and the tissue is in its refractory period, or it cannot be stimulated. Now, like we mentioned before, what happens is both of these tissues will uh, be into their in their refractory period, but both refractory periods will be over by the time the next beat comes. So by the time the SA node is ready to send its next beat, both the slow and fast pathway are at a refractory, and this whole process occurs over and over again. Now, the issue occurs is when we have a premature beat. So I know that, again, we have an impulse that's going to travel down the fast pathway and stimulate my ventricles. It's going to have this long refractory period and it's going to take its time uh, recuperating. We have the slow pathway that takes its time making it down to the ventricles and can't stimulate the ventricles because the fast pathway has already been there. But it has this really fast refractory. So there is a point in time in the AV node where the fast pathway is not in refractory. So if we look at the fast pathway, so that where we've reached this kind of critical time when we see no refractory in the slow pathway, um, but we still have lingering refractory in the fast pathway. And if you think about what that means for the next impulse that comes down, is if we have a premature impulse, so we have an impulse that comes uh, from the SA node a little bit too early. So we have this premature beat. So we'll say we have a premature uh, impulse. And this premature impulse comes down towards the AV node. And what, what's interesting about this is we see that the fast pathway is still in refractory. So instead of traveling down both pathways, it's going to travel down the slow only. And this is where critical timing comes into play, is it travels down this slow pathway. And by the time it makes it to the uh, where we're going to stimulate the ventricles, if we have just right timing, it'll make it there as the fast pathway is coming out of refractory. So we see the uh, fast pathway coming at the fast pathway coming out of refractory. So now this impulse can go down and stimulate the ventricles but it can also swing back up along the fast pathway. And again, if timing is just right, it'll hit the start of the slow pathway just as it's coming out of refractory. And now we have this loop that's formed. Uh, picture someone who's driving in a roundabout and just doesn't want to go get out of it. Um, 
now they can drive in a circle and they can just drive around and around and around and around. And if an uh, impulse is triggered in the ventricles every time that uh, car comes around the roundabout, we're going to see the ventricles fire. And that's what, why we're getting a tachydysrhythmia here. So we make it out of, we have this premature beat that comes in. It stimulates our tissues just as uh, we're in refractory with this lingering refractory in the fast pathway and we have no refractory in the slow pathway and it leads to this cyclic impulse that just travels around and around the AV node and it keeps sending signals down to the ventricles and we end up with this with this tachydysrhythmia this really fast rhythm um, in these AV and uh, nodal uh, tachycardias you can see um, heart rates from you know 150 beats per minute to up to 250 beats per minute so the heart can start generating extremely rapid impulses as a result of this so that's the first cause, or one of the first causes of an AV NRT. So again, it's due to the premature beat. So in order for this to occur, we have to have an accessory pathway present. So if this slow pathway or this accessory pathway is not present, this can't happen. We also need to have the premature beat. So this premature beat has to stimulate the AV node when there is no refractory period in the fat or in the slow pathway and there's a lingering refractory period in the fast pathway. So we have an impulse that is traveling down the slow pathway, but not down the fast pathway. Because again, normally they should be coming down here together like we see here. So they're both traveling down um, and the slow pathway is making it to the uh, pathway leading to the ventricles here as it's still in refractory. So it's not causing stimu stimulus. But what happens here is because this premature beat has come in and the impulse can travel down the slow pathway and it hits the uh, basically the fork in the road where it can travel down to the ventricles but we're just coming out of refractory this lingering refractory period is dissipating and this impulse can also travel back up through the uh, through the fast pathway and it leads to this cyclic firing of the, v, of the a, v node so you can see that timing has to be just right the premature beat has to come at the right time the Impulse has to travel down the slow pathway and make it to the fork in the road where we're going uh, between the ventricle and the, and the fast pathway at the right time. Now, the second cause of this AVNRT is a unidirectional block. So what's happening with a unidirectional block is that part of our fast pathway becomes blocked or it has a one-way blockage in movement. Um, so when we're talking about unidirectional block in AVNRT, what happens is we have this blockage that prevents the fast pathway from traveling down towards the ventricles, but it doesn't prevent an impulse from traveling up through uh, to the SA node and, and to kind of cycle around here. So the conditions that need to be met to have the second cause is, we, again, we have to have an accessory pathway. If we don't have an accessory pathway, then we're not going to see this occur. The second thing in this case is we have to have this unidirectional block. And you can probably guess that the third the third uh, criteria is going to be the same in this as well. We have to have critical timing. Or the timing has to be just right. So if we take a look at what this is going to look like, is I have my fast impulse that's going to try and travel. So we have the impulse that comes from the SA node. So we have this impulse that's traveling from the SA node. I'm gonna stimulate the fast pathway, but in this instance, it can't make it down. So we have this unidirectional block. It's preventing the fast impulse from making its way to the, uh, to the ventricles. Now, we also have our slow pathway that's coming down. And when it makes it here, it would normally find refractive tissue. But this is not occurring because the fast pathway hasn't made it. So now the slow pathway can go and trigger the ventricles. But what it can also do is come back up through this fast pathway and try to cycle around. So you can see that we have a couple of the conditions that have been met here. We have the presence of an accessory pathway that's going to allow for this impulse to come down a, a different side. We have the presence of a unidirectional block or a unidirectional block present that's preventing the fast pathway from making its way down towards the ventricle. Uh, but we also have to have critical timing. So what that means is if we look at, if we don't have critical timing or if we look at this with no critical timing, 
what's going to happen is this impulse is going to come down through the slow pathway. It's going to trigger the ventricles. It's going to come back up through the fast pathway. But if we again draw a refractory period in, in gray, um, what we can see is if this tissue is refractory and this impulse makes its way back up here, it's just going to get blocked. It can't stimulate that tissue. So if we don't have critical timing, we're still not going to have this occur. But what, uh, what has to happen is as this impulse makes its way through, and it also starts coming back up around, if we're now out of refractory, or refractory period has, is over on this pathway, we can now see this cyclical loop, loop occur. And we get an AVNRT, just like we had in the last case. So we have to have critical timing, or we have to have our impulses just outside of our refractory periods in order for this to occur. So again, in both cases, we need to have the formation of an accessory pathway. Um, so we have these fast and slow pathways that exist. Um, we have to have critical timing. So if we're going to have a loop like this occur, then critical timing has to exist for us to see uh, re-entry occurring. And then we either need to have a premature beat or a unidirectional block that's taking advantage of these two things. So in the second picture here, uh, we do see uh, critical timing. And that's why we have the AVNRT occurring. I hope this clears up uh, the pathophysiology around AVNRT or how AVNRT is occurring. And again, this is the most common cause of a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, so this is what you're going to see occurring inside the AV node to cause someone to have an uh, SVT.